Welcome to the lecture over chapter 4, which is on prescriptions, medication orders, and avoiding calculation errors. And I'll be honest with you up front, I'm actually going to deviate from the content in this chapter quite a bit because we will be covering how to read and interpret prescriptions in the pharmacy skills lab So, and spend more time in more detail than they do in the pharmacy calculations textbook. So instead, I want to use this time to still address this issue of avoiding calculation errors, but primarily doing so by making sure and having you practice your skills of the conceptualizing process process for these word problems. As I mentioned in the first lecture, one of the four C's in pharmacy calculations is conceptualization. It's being able to truly extract out the information provided to you, reorganize it so that you understand what you know and can develop a plan to solve for what you need. So I think that's where we'll spend most of the time in this lecture uh, practicing. And we're going to start with a word problem that has absolutely nothing to do with pharmacy. But bear with me. This is a great mental exercise to help you really understand the idea of labeling what you know and identifying what you don't know so that you can then figure out how to solve the problem. So bear with me on this and see if you can find the answer to this. It's not as easy as you think. So this problem reads that a baseball bat and a ball combined cost $1.10 in total. Now, the bat itself costs $1 more than the ball. So the question asks, how much does the ball cost? And I'll warn you now, the intuitive answer of 10 cents is not right. So it's not as easy to solve as you might think. So take a minute, see if you can kind of think through how to solve this problem, and then I'll show you my work. Let me show you my work for this problem. And I want to tell you now, I'm going to express all the monetary amounts in cents. So instead of dollars and cents, my numbers will be cents. So a dollar will be 100 because that represents 100 cents. Okay? So just be clear on that. Now, so this, is an, this whole question's point is to have you describe what you know and what you don't know. So what is the question asking for? The question wants to know how much does the ball cost? That's our final answer. Do we know that? No. We don't know that. That's what we want to solve for. So let's go ahead and label that, though, as x. This is really going to use algebra to solve this question. So let's assign the cost of the ball, again, in sense, to x. We don't know it. What is the cost of the bat? We don't know what the cost is exactly, but we do know something about the bat. We were told that the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. Do we know how much the ball costs? No and yes. We don't know it, but we assign that the cost of the ball is X. So we can describe the cost of the bat in terms of its relationship to the cost of the ball by saying that the cost of the bat is equal to the cost of the ball, which we're going to call X, plus a dollar, which is a hundred cents. So you'll notice I said that the cost of the bat is equal to X plus 100. This is key. Do you understand that? We don't know the cost of the ball, so we called it X. We know that the bat is a dollar more than the ball, so that means that the bat is equal to X plus 100. And we know, or we were also told in the question, that the combination of both the bat and the ball in total cost 110 cents, or $1.10. So these relationships, once you see these relationships, hopefully it becomes pretty clear how to actually solve it. And that's my point. You first write what you know and what you don't know. And then looking at those things, you determine how to solve for what you need. In this case, we clearly need to solve for x because x is the cost of the ball and it's the only variable we have in, our, in what we know. So what we know is that the bat plus the ball equals 110 cents. So let's substitute our algebra. The ball was x, so we'll say x plus, and then the bat was the quantity of x plus 100, so x plus x plus 100 equals 110. So doing algebra, x plus x equals 2x. So we have 2x plus 100 equals 110. Subtract 100 from both sides, then we gives us 2x equals 10. Divide 10 by 2, and we can solve that x equals 5 cents. So now we can summarize and go back and say, okay, well, x equals 5, and we said x was equal to the cost of the ball. So the ball costs 5 cents. 
And we know that the bat was x plus 100, so we know the bat now is 105 cents, or a dollar and five cents. So hopefully this illustrates for you this process of not just making quick mental assumptions in these questions, or else you might have just assumed that the ball cost 10 cents. That's not what the question really said. So take your time, analyze the information provided to you, rewrite it, and then use that information to come up with a plan on how to solve the problem. Let's complete one more, I promise this is the last non-pharmacy related question, but let's do one more excellent example of this idea of conceptualization and how our brain likes patterns. And sometimes that pattern though can leave it, lead us to the wrong answer if we're not careful. So in this question, it says, if it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take a hundred machines to make a hundred widgets? Okay. So I'll give you some time to think through that. I'm telling you now my point about the patterning. It might make sense that, well, then 100 machines would take 100 minutes to make 100 widgets. That idea of that pattern does not hold true. So the 100 is not the right answer. So take a minute. Try to use algebra and restate what you know versus what you don't know and see if you can solve this problem. The trick to this question is really rewriting that first sentence, extracting the information and realizing what we have here is a ratio. We have a comparison of widgets to machines to minutes and time. Okay, So the idea of five machines take five minutes to make five widgets, let's exchange that with the, with the word per. Because, again, ratios, when you divide by something, you usually say per, okay? And remember, what the question is wants to know is how, many, how much time for the widgets. So let's express the ratio per widgets, all right? By that, I mean, rewriting that first sentence, we can say it also says that it takes, it, that there are five widgets produced per five machines per five minutes, that's what that sentence is saying, that there are five widgets produced per five machines per five minutes. And the use of the word per helps you understand the relationship. So let's set up a ra ratio or relationship. We can put five widgets in the numerator and then the per in the denominator. And we have two things in the denominator. It's really five widgets per five machines per five minutes. Okay. So you can say five widgets over five machines times five minutes in the denominator, okay? And you can multiply that. And even though the units won't cancel, we can combine the numbers. So five divided by 25 is 0 0.2. So we can convert the five widgets per five machines per five minutes down to saying that that is really a rate of 0 0.2 widgets per machine minute. Okay, so the denominator has both of the machine and the minutes because that's the rate. 0.2 widgets are per machine and per minute. Okay, now if I gave you that value, you'd probably be able to solve it. If you were able to convert it to 0 0.2 widgets per machine minute, then that's a rate, if you will. We can use dimensional analysis to solve for what we need to solve for. So let's use that rate and use our new situation because now we want to know how long it would take if we used 100 machines. Well, let's use that 100 machines to convert our rate from widgets per machine minute to just widgets per minute. So 100 machines times a 0 0.2 widgets per machine minute, machine units will cancel and we would get 100 times 0.2, which is 20. So that leaves us with 20 widgets per minute. Okay, it's getting easier here at 20 widgets per minute. Then the question asks how long, you can see we have a unit of time here, would it take to make 100 widgets? So the last step would be to take what we're interested in, 100 widgets, times, now we're going to use that rate and set it up so that our units cancel. Let's take 100 widgets times in, a, in one minute on the numerator, it, we produce 20 widgets. So widgets cancel and we have 100 divided by 20 and our final answer is 5 minutes. So it takes 5 minutes for 100 machines to produce 100 widgets if they pr produce them at a rate of 0 0.2 widgets per machine per minute. 
That was the trick, is being able to come up with that ratio, that relationship of the of what was provided to us in the question. And that this was a tricky one, but it shows and highlights how important it is to rewrite, rethink, re-express the information given to you in a way that allows you to solve for the final answer. Okay, let's get back into pharmacy. This is a fairly straightforward and easy question. That does require, though, for you to understand one important concept to be able to get the question right. So, let's read the question. It says, a pharmacist has mixed 64 milligrams of an experimental drug with 320 milligrams of lactose, which is simply used as a diluent. What is the concentration of the drug expressed in milligrams of the drug per milligram of the total mixture? Okay. So, with that, see if you can answer this question. It is pretty straightforward. Rewrite what you know and then figure out how to go about solving for your final answer. All right, I'll show you my work for this problem here. Rewriting what we know. Let's just separate it. What we know is that the weight of the drug in the mixture is going to be 64 milligrams. Okay. We also know that the weight of the lactose is 320 milligrams. What would be wrong at this point was just to assume that the answer would be the value of 64 divided by 320 because there's a concept missing here. So when we conceptualize the problem, we need to understand what we're solving for is the concentration of the drug in the total mixture. And we need to remember that when combining solids, their weights are additive. So what I don't know is the combined weight of the mixture when we add both the drug and the lactose together. I'll need that to be able to actually solve for the problem. So then to actually set up and solve for this problem, what you could do is say, okay, what I need to do to determine concentration of the drug is put the weight of the drug on the numerator, which is 64 milligrams. And then in the denominator, I need to place the sum of both the 64 milligrams of drug plus the 320 milligrams of lactose that I'm going to be combining it with. Therefore, you can change that to saying that's equal to the 64 milligrams of my drug divided by a combined weight of 384 milligrams of mixture. That's the concentration I would need to solve for. So when I do that numerically and take 64 divided by 384, I see that my final answer is 0 0.17 milligrams of drug per milligrams of mixture. And that is the answer for this question. All right, let's try our next question. This problem states that a 10 milliliter vial containing 100 units of insulin per milliliter and we have a patient who is going to administer 20 units per day. So there are two questions. First, we want to know how many days or how many days supply would the vial last? And secondly, if the patient returned to the pharmacy in seven weeks for another vial, is the patient adherent? Point being, is that a reasonable time for a patient to need a refill? Remember, the goal of this question is to have you practice writing out what you know. So rewrite the information from the question, decide what you still need to know and how you need to arrange and, and mix the things that you know in such a way so that you can obtain your final answer. So let's rewrite and label what we know. What we know from the question is, is that the volume of the vial contains 10 milliliters. We also know and can express the concentration as 100 units per milliliter. And what we know is an administration rate, that the patient will be using 20 units per day. Because in the end, the question, this first part of the question wants to know how many days. So the one thing that we know about days is the administration rate. How do we get to the administration rate to be able to convert the volume to the number of days? Well, I think the best way to approach this would be to use the concentration to first convert the volume that we have in milliliters to a total number of units. When I know the number of units, then I can use the administration rate to use to convert from units to days. So hopefully you can kind of see that progression. But it's the idea of writing out what you know, and especially including the units, 
looking at how you can combine those that information and the units in a way that you can end up with the information you need at the end, which in this case is days. So let's, let's follow our plan. Let's start and convert volume to total units. So we would take 10 milliliters times the concentration expressed as 100 units per milliliter. That way the units of milliliters cancel, okay? And then we're in units. Then we can multiply by the administration rate, but expressed as per every one day over 20 units. And we do it that way so that the units of units cancel and we're left in days. And that's why, again, with the dimensional analysis, by setting it up this way, even before you do the math, you can see milliliters will cancel, units will cancel, and my final answer will be in days. So let's just take 10 times 100, which would be 1,000, divided by 20, and our numeric answer would be 50, and the units are days. So this 10 milliliter vial will last for 50 days, which is the answer to this question. Let's do the same sort of thing with the second part to this question. We'll carry over our answer before, from part one because we now know that the day supply of this vial is 50 days. What we need to know is whether or not the patient is adherent, meaning that if they come back in seven weeks, that that matches the 50-day supply. So we know the patient use duration is seven weeks, but the problem here, and it's a pretty simple problem, is how do we compare 50 days to seven weeks? So let's go ahead and convert the patient duration from weeks to days, and then we can compare it to our answer of 50 days. That's a pretty straightforward issue. So let's start with seven weeks and multiply that by the fact that there are seven days per week. Units of weeks cancel. So seven times seven is 49 days. So let's compare the 49 days so that the patient's adherence or the duration to the day supply, which is 50 days. And that's basically about the same. That makes sense. They'd want to come in before the vial was actually empty. So I, would, uh, I think we can conclude based off of that that this patient is adherent to their use of insulin. Let's move on to the next question. Here we're looking at an experimental drug substance that's been shown to be embryotoxic in rats at doses of 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. What we're going to want to do is express this dose in different units on the basis of micrograms per pound per day. I give you the conversion factor of one kilogram is the same equal to 2.2 pounds. And I also tell you to round your answer to the nearest whole number. So I'll give you a second to see if you can find the correct answer compared to one of the options given on this slide. I think this is a pretty straightforward question, but I wanted it to highlight this idea of conceptualizing values. So because we have two weight values, there is the weight in milligrams and there's a weight per kilogram. So which is which? What you should try to interpret out of here is the rate of 50 milligrams per kilogram per day means that the milligram represents the weight of the drug whereas the kilogram represents the weight of the rat, or the, the body weight, if you will. And those are two separate factors, even though they're both measures of weight. Okay. Also, and this happens a lot, you will very often see doses or some expressions in, in some unit of milligram per kilogram per day, where you've got two things in the denominator. Here we have a numerator of 50 milligrams, but you have it per kilogram and per day, kind of going back to like what we had with the widgets example rewrite those expressions. Those are somewhat complicated expressions, but rewrite them with only one numerator and combine everything else that goes in the denominator together with a, and separate them by a dash. So essentially, if you see my work here, I express that as 50 milligrams in the numerator over or per, then the two units in the denominator are both kilograms and days. They're both there. So we separate them by a dash. So it's 50 milligrams per kilogram dash day. Okay, so we have essentially three sets of units in this one expression, 50 milligrams per kilogram dash day. So what we need to do, all we're asking in this question is to convert units. We want to re-express that in micrograms per pound per day. So the day part doesn't change, but clearly we need to exchange the weight of the drug from milligrams to micrograms and convert the weight of uh, kilograms and express it in pounds. So there are just two conversions we need to do. You can do them in whichever order you want it. Let's, in my example, convert the weight on top for the drug first. So to convert to milligrams and to cancel milligrams, I'm going to multiply by the fact that there are a thousand micrograms per one milligram. 
That way the units, if you multiply across, the milligram units will cancel, and I now have a value expressed in micrograms per kilogram per day. But remember, I also need to change the kilogram. So let's multiply by the fact that we are provided that in one kilogram in the numerator per 2.2 pounds. And we put the kilogram unit in the numerator because it needs to cancel the kilogram in the denominator of the 50 milligrams per kilogram. So if we multiply that across, kilograms also cancel, and I will be in pounds. So if I do all that math across, I would end up with 22,727 as the number, which is obtained by 50 times 1,000 divided by 2.2. But my units then that remain are micrograms essentially in the numerator, per, then pound in the denominator, and day is still there as well. So that's 22,727 micrograms per pound per day. Our next question is a very common dosing problem that you'll experience in pharmacy. Let's first start by reading and interpreting the prescription on the left-hand side. And essentially what has been prescribed is a drug called Omnicef and an oral suspension that has a concentration of 125 milligrams per 5 milliliters. We were, it was described to dispense 100 milliliters of that suspension. And the dose was to give 14 milligrams per kilogram per day in two divided doses for or times 10 days. Okay, So kind of a complicated sig there. Uh, then the problem itself, what we're trying to solve for us is, what is the dose in teaspoons full of the following prescription if the patient weighs 39.4 pounds? And I'll remind you, I give you both conversions that you'll need, which is a weight conversion that one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds, and that one teaspoonful is equal to 5 milliliters. So see if you can determine what the dose, an individual dose, would be in teaspoons full. Let's break this question down by first writing out what we know. Because between the prescription and the additional information, there's a lot of information we know. Once we know and see what we have to work with, we can decide on how to approach this problem. So the first thing we know is that the patient's body weight was given to us as 39.4 pounds. So we have a body weight. We also have a drug concentration. We know that the suspension provides 125 milligrams per 5 milliliters. We can also see that the treatment duration was 10 days. And I guess the most complicated part to this is the dose. We were told that to give 14 milligrams per kilogram per day. That's per day. However, this is the tricky part. It was said to be in two divided doses. So the daily dose whatever the amount they take per day, would have to be divided into two for an individual dose. So you can see I wrote that as 14 milligrams per kilogram slash day over two doses daily because that's kind of the trick to this question. We were given a daily total dose but then told that that dose has to be divided further into two. Okay? So let's, well, how do we get to where we need to go to? We're trying to solve for the dose the weight of the drug per teaspoonful this patient needs for an individual dose. Well, we got to start with the fact that the dosing is based off of body weight, but the body weight needs to be converted from pounds to kilograms to be able to use the dosing that we have. Okay, so we're going to have to convert the body weight to kilograms. We're also going to need to take that total daily dose, like I said, and divide it into two so we can solve for an individual dose. Lastly, the volume in, will have to be re-expressed in terms of teaspoonsful. So again, not per milliliter, but per teaspoonful. So the volume will have to be converted in the end. Okay. And lastly, we can conclude that whole thing about the treatment duration for 10 days isn't needed. That's not part of the information we need to determine an individual dose. So we're going to disregard that information. So now that we've come up with a plan of attack, we can actually work to numerically solve for this problem. So let's complete each step one at a time. Our first step was to convert the patient's body weight from pounds to kilograms. So we'll do that by taking the 39.4 pounds times one kilogram on top over 2.2 pounds, divide by 2.2 so that the units of pounds cancel. And we can see that that means the patient has a body weight of 17.9 kilograms. 
Now let's determine the total daily dose by taking our 17.9 kilograms times, express the dose as 14 milligrams in the numerator, over or per kilogram dash day, and we can see that the units of kilograms will cancel. So you do that math, and you can see that 17.9 times 14 is 250.6, and the units are going to then be milligrams per day. Now I emphasize day, because now we need to know the milligrams per dose. So let's take the 250.6 milligrams per day times the fact in one day there are two doses. That way the units of day cancel, and when we divide by two, we see that there's 125.3 milligrams per dose. The last step is we don't want to express, or we're trying to find the volume per dose. So we're going to have to take the dose of 125.3 milligrams per dose and use the concentration to convert that to a volume. So let's multiply by the concentration expressed as, for every 5 milliliters in the numerator, there's 125 milligrams in the denominator. That way the units of milligram cancel, and we really are expressing now in milliliters per dose, but remember we need to convert that to teaspoons full, so let's multiply that by the fact that there in one teaspoon full there is 5 milliliters. By having milliliters in the denominator, milliliters will cancel. And our final answer is essentially in teaspoons per dose. And the final answer is essentially one. So numerically, what this patient needs is one teaspoonful per dose, which means they would get two teaspoons full in a day to provide the total daily dose. And they would need to complete that for all 10 days. This is the last question for this lecture, and it's kind of a tricky one. And you'll see here at the end, I chose it specifically because hopefully you'll get the right answer. Because unfortunately, another pharmacist made a mistake with this calculation that led to a patient death. Because this is a chemotherapy drug, which is very toxic, unfortunately. So let's see if you can get the right answer, though. In this case, it says an oncologist which is a doctor used to treat cancer. So this is a chemo drug or a drug used for cancer. So the oncologist placed an order for a continuous infusion of this drug, fluorouracil, at a rate of 200 milligrams per meter squared, and that dose over 100 hours. So the question is, what is the total dose received in milligrams for a patient weighing 55 kilograms and with a body surface area of 1.4 meters squared. And round your answer to the nearest whole number. All right, so you have enough information to solve this question, so go ahead and do it, and let's see if you get the right answer. So rewriting what we know from the question, let's label it as first we know the patient's body weight is 55 kilograms. We know that their body surface area is 1.4 meters squared. We were given the, the drug dose, and let's express it as 200 milligrams in the numerator per, and in the denominator we said metered squared per day. So we'll do dash day. So it's 200 milligrams per meter squared dash day. That was provided to us. And that the length of the infusion that the doctor wanted was it to last for 100 hours. So the length of infusion of this drug that will run continuously, but for a total of 100 hours. So that's all the information provided to us. And essentially, we're trying to determine the total dose. Not a dosing rate in meters squared per day, but a total dose in just milligrams of the drug. Huh. Okay, so we do know a dosing rate in 200 milligrams per meter squared per day. So my first conclusion is that the dose is going to be based off a of body surface area. Therefore, the information on body weight isn't necessary. We're not going to use that number. That's just additional information we don't need to solve the problem. We do need the body surface area, certainly, and we do need the drug dose. The other thing, the total dose, though, if you look at the rate of 200 milligrams per meter squared per day, it tells you that the total dose in just milligrams will depend on two things. It is going to depend on both the patient's body surface area, but also the length of infusion. Obviously, the more days and the we were, you know, more time that we use, the more do drug dose. So again, we're going to have to factor in both the body surface area and the length of infusion to be able to determine this total dose. Now that we know what to do, uh, the math is pretty straightforward. So let's first use the body surface area to determine the patient's specific dose per day. 
and we'll do that by using their body surface area of 1.4 meters squared times the dosing expressed as 200 milligrams per meter square dash day, and I multiply that across, I see that that gives me, when our meter squared units cancel, then we get 280 milligrams per day. Okay, we're almost there. The only other challenge here is that we said the duration will determine the dose, but the duration was given to us an hour, so we're going to have to convert that. So let's take first 100 hours times in one day in the numerator, there are 24 hours. That way the units of hours cancel, and I'm now in essentially the units of day. Now I can multiply that by the 280 milligrams per day. My units of day will cancel, and my final value will be in milligrams. If we round that to the nearest whole number, my final numeric answer would be 1,167 milligrams. What's important to see here, though? The units are milligrams, not milligrams per day, right? Because the units of day cancel because we multiplied by the number of days converted from 100 hours. This is important in my last slide here. But the final answer here, and again, using the dimensional analysis, I know I'm right with this answer because all of my other units canceled, which mean my answer is 1,167 milligrams. The reason I emphasize this idea of the units is because this is the error the pharmacist made who actually made this prescription is that they did all the same calculations we just did. So if you look in the first three bullet points, the pharmacist correctly calculated and got to the same answer of us as 1,100 and theirs was 72. I rounded ours to 100 hours instead of 105, which has happened in the real example. But essentially, the first three bullet points, if you read through those, that's what we got. But the pharmacist was confused that that dose in milligrams was still a daily dose. For some reason, they forgot that by using the 105 hours that they canceled that. And this is not a daily dose, but the dose for the entire treatment. And still then took that number and multiplied it again by 5 for the 105 hours. So basically gave a five-fold overdose when they actually infused the concentration for the patient, and unfortunately the patient died from that. So anyways, hopefully you got the right answer and can kind of see how important it is to keep your units and check on your units to make sure you know what your final answer actually re represents. And lastly, I just want to summarize the whole point for this lecture wasn't necessarily the math that we were using, but the process that we used to read and interpret the word problem rewrite the information provided to us and think to us and think what do I know and how can I use that how can I combine that in a way to then solve for the information I need so hopefully you'll find this lecture useful